Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have a talk uh, right now from Isabel Gable. And uh, we look forward to the question and discussion afterwards. Isabel Gable is a historian of science, medicine, and political thought. She is currently an LC postdoctoral fellow in the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. On August 1st, 2021, she will begin a position as a postdoctoral fellow at the Stevanovich Institute on the Formation of Knowledge at the University of Chicago. Isabel's work has appeared in journals including History of the Human Sciences, Revue de Histoire de Science, and the AMA Journal of Ethics. First of all, um, I want to thank Chris and Brittany in particular, um, and also this whole team at NHGRI for making this event possible. Um, I'm really honored to be here at the celebration of David DePew's work. Um, thinking, thinking about the themes of this gathering, I decided to take it as an opportunity to uh, think through the limits of genocentrism, um, especially when it comes to thinking about uh, evolution as a process entwined with human history. What do I mean by this? Simply put, the vision of evolutionary history offered by mid-century linear genetic theory is no longer very plausible. As biologists move beyond classical genetics and the central dogma and towards accounts of heredity that are less linear and more somatic, for example, in the fields of epigenetics, gene regulation studies, environmental genetics, how does the meaning of genetics for history change? I think this is a really important contemporary question and one which DePew's work can very well help us think through. I also think it's a question with a really long history um, and that's part of what I wanna to discuss today. What does evolutionary theory and genetics role within that theory mean for human history? I'm currently completing a book that tracks this question in 20th century thought. And my talk today draws from chapters one and two of this book. In particular, uh, today I'm gonna to discuss the de some debates within French evolutionary theory that became really central to French ideas about history um, and to French philosophy of history. Uh, and the most important thing to flag up front is that the debates uh, about that I'm gonna talk about today were within the kind of realm of French neo-Lamarckism. In other words, non-Darwinian evolutionary thought. So in the first part of my talk, I'm gonna go over some key features of neo-Lamarckism in France. And here the central question that I'm exploring and that the figures I'm talking about are exploring are, what is, what is life such that we can know its history? In the second part, I'll give some examples of how the failure of the experimental program of neo-Lamarckism led to conceptual innovation among these scientists. Here, the question that supplants, I mean, so, sorry, that, that supplements but does not supplant the first is, in what sense is it possible to know the past? Finally, I'll show how concepts and interpretive frameworks from evolutionary theory made their way into philosophical approaches to history. And to do so, I'll talk briefly about how Raymond Aron, arguably the most famous French liberal of the 20th century, found the Neo-Lamarckian tradition to be a resource for his, his, for his theory of history. Specifically, I'll argue that Neo-Lamarckism offered Aron an epistemological path beyond universal history and helped him develop his critique of Hegelian Marxism. Here, the question could be stated as, can historical knowledge be universal or objective? So Neo-Lamarckism was a heterogeneous tradition, but it was characterized by three main features a belief in the inheritance of acquired characteristics, a rejection of Darwinism, and a rejection of Mendelism. French biologists did not believe that evolution could be explained by natural selection. In many cases, they conceded that selection might cause the elimination of disadvantageous traits, but this could still not explain how new traits came into being. They were also often resistant to the Darwinian model of the environment, which seemed to impose what they called an ultimatum of the milieu. For them, 
the organism environment relationship was one primarily of adaptation, not danger or competition. Meanwhile, they rejected genetics as somewhere between irrelevant and flat out false. But then by the 19 teens, two of the most important biology chairs in Paris were held by students of the French ethologist, Alfred Giard. At the Sorbonne, Etienne Rabaud was the chair of experimental biology and Maurice Collery was chair of the quote, evolution of organized beings. Their shared teacher, Giard, had conceived of his project as a corrective tendency to the tendency since the 19th century um, their teacher, Giard, had conceived of his project as a corrective to the tendency since the work of the 19th century physiologist Claude Bernard to distinguish too sharply between morphology and physiology. As Raph de Bon has shown, Giard aspired to a general biology that brought form and function together by studying organisms within their milieus. This emphasis on the inseparability of form and function and on the importance of milieu played a role in Rabot and Collery's rejection of genetic theories of heredity. Rabot was extremely influential and was known for having, quote, declared war once and for all on Mendelism. For example, in 1912, he got into a heated exchange with an agricultural geneticist who had accused him of lacking evidence for his neo-Lamarckian claims. The French Rabot uh, insisted did not cling to neo-Lamarckism because they relied on reason above experimental proof, but rather because, quote, in observing and experimenting, it is not enough to represent the results by an assemblage of letters. For Rabot, genes weren't only arbitrary abstractions. They also falsely and impossibly divided the organism into mutually independent parts that could be recombined in any way. Mendelian genetics violated an intuitive and obvious principle in his view, which was the continuity of matter. For Rabaud, heredity was transparent and simple. The true question was about plasticity, the ways, the organisms, the ways that organisms change in response to their environments. But as a result, a tension arose between the need to explain changes, individual morphological adaptations, and explain stability or the persistence of species over time. But you might ask, well, why wasn't natural selection a possible solution to exactly this question? Before the modern synthesis, which brought wide, if not complete consensus on the compatibility between genetics and evolutionary theory, many French biologists understood selection as a purely negative force. They rejected the idea that selection could provide anything beyond the elimination of maladaptive traits. They accepted that selective forces might operate to eliminate the unfit, but there was no way in their view that it could explain fitness itself. Um, in this case, it also could not explain the development of new species. This may have been a misunderstanding of Darwin, but it was also reflective of a genuine gap in scientific knowledge at the time. It was as yet unknown how it was or by what precise mechanism novel traits were produced in nature. Darwinian selection acted on phenotypes, but the source of new phenotypes still had to be explained. For Neo-Lamarckians before 1930 or so, this was the primary goal of experimental biology. How did new phenotypes come into being? In 1910, Collery was in, in fact wrote a sort of treatise on evolution as an experimental science. He declared that, in my opinion, which is an opinion that is neither revolutionary nor even original, the most fruitful efforts in the study of evolution are those which implement experimentation as directly as possible. But of course, Collery wasn't merely stating the obvious. He was in fact countering a 19th century perception originating perhaps with Claude Bernard, that zoology was merely an observational or quote, contemplative science. Establishing evolutionary biology as an experimental science was of utmost importance to Neo-Lamarckians. Collery made the case that given that the past was in some fundamental way inaccessible and not subject to direct experimentation, it was imperative that evolutionary biologists 
uh, experimentally probe the present. But if evolution in the past can necessarily never be more than a hypothesis, he wrote, while in truth being so plausible that it borders on certainty, can we not arrive at certainty itself in regard to the evolution of nature in the present? If the present state of nature is the result of evolution, there is no reason for this evolution to be stopped. It must continue before our eyes. We must see the forms vary, new species form, at least under certain particular conditions we can hope to find, and we must seek the mechanism by which they are formed, and these acquired results will be a verification of all that's past. This is where experimentation comes in, and let's face it, he wrote, we are, all in, we are in this matter a lot less advanced. It is therefore in this direction that we must focus our efforts. Experimentalism was tied, in other words, to the belief that evolution was ongoing in the present, still in process, and that the, pro and that the processes of life's diversification and advancement were still ongoing. Colliery made this declaration in 1910, but by 1930, seeing that experimentation had not only failed to provide a verification of all the past, but in fact yielded almost no progress towards understanding evolution, he abandoned experimentation altogether. More on that in a moment. But first, very briefly, I wanna go back over what I just sketched out. So I've tried to give you a broad strokes overview of the major agenda of French neo-Lamarckism at this period at the turn of the century. Um, they rejected genetics as a fictitious abstraction, superimposed upon normal variation, and as a specious reduction of the organism to component parts. They rejected natural selection on the grounds that it only explained the negative phenomena, the elimination of unfit traits, but could not explain how new species came into being. For Neo-Lamarckians, organisms were adaptive and active in their environments, and this was the only plausible way to explain fitness and by extension, evolution. So the answer to that original question, what is life such that we can know its history, was that life was whole, individuated, continuous, plastic, creative, evolving. So now moving to section two, the aim of the experimentalism, of this experimental agenda was to demonstrate that by altering the conditions of development, i.e. the organism's milieu, individual organisms were capable of adapting physiologically and morpho morphologically in ways that were in turn passed down to future generations. The precise mechanism of transmission was less important than the idea that somatic changes in response to the environment were the engine of evolution. Here I'm just repeating the idea that plasticity was of greater interest to French Neo-Lamarckians than heredity. But throughout the first decade of the 20th century, the first several decades, it was becoming increasingly clear that experimental results were not in favor of the inheritance of acquired characteristics as an explanation for evolution. This situation in which experimental results failed to support an entrenched theoretical apparatus caused a slow moving epistemological crisis in French biology. This crisis, I wanna suggest, gave rise to a period of great creativity in French evolutionary thought. So in this section, I'm gonna argue how in response to experimental failures, Neo-Lamarckians began to accept Mendelism in limited cases, but not as an explanation for evolution, to move away from experimentalism and towards description and that they, I'm gonna argue that they did so on the grounds that if the inheritance of acquired characteristics could not be shown to operate in the present, this must be because the laws of nature had changed over time. And the implication being that evolution might have concluded or at least slowed down so much as to be meaningless. So now I'll just return to Colliery. Uh, like, like his colleague Rabot, Colliery never believed genetics could explain evolution. Genetics might be a useful formalization of heredity, but they could, it, but it couldn't explain um, plasticity. This was in part because the concept of mutation, as I said before, was at the time really conceived of um, as only in, in terms of loss or deletion. As he wrote, 
It is significant that when we have started with, muta with mutations and genetics and tried to formulate an explanation of evolution, we have only arrived at disconcerting paradoxes. We would have to admit that new forms resulted from successive losses in their genotypes. That is to say, evolutionary, evolutionally superior forms of the animal and vegetable kingdom are due to a progressive simplification of the initial complexity of the most primitive and inferior forms. Thus, man would seem to be a simplified amoeba. No doubt there is a touch of humor in the idea, although it reveals an embarrassment in constructing the theory of evolution on the basis of mutations. Coleridge drew in part here on the work of Felix Le Dantec, a prolific and widely known biologist who had argued in 1910 on the basis of thermodynamics, that life forms had stabilized and evolution had come to an end. Ledantec argued that plasticity was a property of all life, but that it decreased as complexity grew. That is, while the simplest organisms could be transformed easily by the environment, as complexity increased, heredity became more powerful than plasticity. Colery began to believe with Ledantec that the ability of organisms to vary with environmental conditions or their plasticity was a function that decreased with the complexity and morphological specialization of living beings. In other words, as complexity had increased, evolution had slowed and was at a near standstill. In the 19 teens, Colery published a, um, an essay on the nature of biological law. He argued that whereas, quote, in the entire range of the inorganic world, in mechanics, physics, chemistry, the idea of law is in fact universal, uncontested, given. This was not the same in biology. If it were, he wrote, his task would be completed. Nevertheless, the apparent alternative, which to him was vitalism, was incoherent, merely a modern form of finalism that rendered experimentation meaningless. Colery pointed to Claude Bernard's ambivalence about vitalism as symptomatic of this kind of contradiction. On the one hand, Bernard's concept of the milieu intérieur was a kind of, as he called it, intraorganic teleology. On the other hand, Colery pointed out, Bernard did not let this undermine his own experimental determinism. Therefore, Bernard would have rejected 20th century vitalism precisely because it rendered positive biology in other words, experimental knowledge, incoherent. Colery concluded with a call for epistemic modesty, citing Le Dantec's assertion that honest science should be merely descriptive. He developed this point in what was arguably his most influential work, his 1931, The Problem of Evolution. So here's a cover of the cover of the book, which says, the fact of evolution prevails, only the mechanism remains uncertain. Colery in this text repeated the case against genetics as a, as a mechanism. He asked, are mutations as presently understood really evolutionary processes? That is to say, are they capable of giving rise to distinct species and of eventually splitting up into diverse groups? He illustrated his question with this drawing of hooded rats from a study done by the American geneticist, William Castle. To Colery, it was obvious that no matter whether the Mendelian ratios held, they only described intraspecies variation and could not lead to the emergence of new species. In continuing to reject mutation as a mechanism of evolution, Colery acknowledged that he was in an epistemic bind. The existence of Mendelian mechanisms of inheritance were experimentally verifiable, and even one of his own students had shown this. Soft inheritance, or the inheritance of acquired characteristics, was not. For this reason, Colery suggested that perhaps experimentalism was not the best approach to evolutionary science after all. As he wrote, Nature herself probably no longer performs such experiments at the present time and has realized them only at certain epochs with our, with, without our being able to discover the reason. She does not keep repeating them continually. In general, therefore, species are stable, 
at least in the present epoch. It seems that at the present time, we do not know whether stabilized nature and genetics will inform us of the, moda of the modalities of this stability. As seems probable to me, do evolutionary transformations depend on some other causes which still elude us? In many ways, this was a very timely attitude. This late phase neo-Lamarckism took shape against the backdrop of World War I and its aftermath. The idea of continuous progress in history was becoming ever more doubtful across Europe. This naturally extended to evolutionary thought and to the limits of Darwin's attitude, famous attitude at the end of the origin in this famous line, um, which will be familiar to most of you. Um, there is grandeur in this view of life with several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. But for Neo-Lamarckians, evolution was no longer endless. This brings us to the fact that during the very period in which biologists like Colliery were reassessing the evolutionary past and the evolutionary future, an important generation of philosophers was emerging very nearby at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. In the mid 20s, figures including Raymond Daron, Jean-Paul Sartre, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Georges Canguilhem, and semi-officially Simone de Beauvoir all completed philosophy training at the UNS. The status of biology was of great interest to this group. And so what I'm gonna do in the last section of my talk today um, is show a few ways in which this Neo-Lamarckian uh, tradition uh, and these debates uh, made their way into this philosophical milieu. So this brings me to the final part of my talk today um, in which I'll talk too briefly about um, the philosophical reception of this set of scientific debates. So I'm focusing today on Raymond Aron. Um, and Aron was perhaps, as I mentioned, the most famous French liberal of the 20th century, philosopher, sociologist, journalist. Aron was um, has mostly been celebrated as a champion of liberal reason against the quote, ten, uh, totalitarian temptations of the age. His most famous book, the 1955 Opium of the Intellectuals was an attack on the French left for what he saw as their uncritical and even hypocritical embrace of communism. But before becoming a liberal critic of the left, Aron trained in philosophy alongside Sartre and Kangyan, uh, they were all in the same class, um, and his dissertation, Introduction to the Philosophy of History, was an attempt to assess the possibilities of objective historical knowledge uh, while rejecting the idealism of his neo-Kantian teachers, as well as the tendency towards Hegelianism among his peers. In the thesis, Aron developed a kind of perspectival approach to history in which knowledge was possible, but inherently finite. At the time, this was perceived as quite radical, even scandalous. As the dissertation defense, he was famously accused of being either desperate or satanic in his attack on uh, French academic tradition um, and on his teacher's ideas. Um, but more importantly for our purposes, Aron uh, began this work on the philosophy of history as a research project on Mendelian genetics. After several months of research in Paris and a period of military service, he went to Germany as an exchange student in 1930. Um, and it was in Germany that he wrote the thesis. Crucial chapters through the work were devoted to biology and evolutionary thought. Um, in other words, this thesis on history emerged out of his study of, of biology in the 20s. And in this regard, uh, Colliery was a really important source for Aron. To Aron, uh, biologists appeared satisfied simply to demonstrate the fact of descent. Moreover, the standoff between Lamarckism and Darwinism, Darwinism as he saw it, 
had resulted in a kind of anti-finalism, which he saw exemplified in Rabaud. Uh, for biologists, history had become what he called a series of events and no longer an intelligible sequence. This doctrine of chance reached its apex in genetics, which made living forms, quote, reducible to assemblages of vital atoms, of genes. In 1938, Aron could follow by conceding that, of course, most biologists found this genetic concept of life unsatisfying, because in France, it was still true that most biologists found this unsatisfying. Colery was chief among them, but Arome pointed out that in claiming that different mechanisms operated in the past then could be observed in the present, in other words, Colery's argument about the transformation of natural law, um, in that case, Colery was challenging and undermining the very idea of meaning in history. In Arone's reading, Colery's conclusions about the epistemic limits of evolutionary theory had profound implications for the philosophy of history. It implied that certain forms of causality might, it implied that certain forms of causality might apply on some temporal scales, but not on others. In a chapter on time in history, he wrote that if certain laws eliminate history from a certain point of view, they also imply a discontinuous causal framework that excludes the exact repetition of, a, of the state of the total universe that time moved in one direction, that it was irreversible, allowed Aron to see causality and singularity as reconcilable. And he continued, in any case on our scale, we see a real multiplicity, which leads at the same time to the opposition of chance and evolution, to the irreversibility of becoming. For Aron, Coleria's writing on evolutionary theory identified a sim similar problem to the one facing the philosophy of history. How to understand the past from the perspective of an epistemically unstable present. And it also suggested some possible solutions. Running orthogonal perhaps to our contemporary expectations, evolutionary theory gave Aron license to limit the claims that could be made about the deep past. It was only by acknowledging these limits, he believed, that man's historical nature could begin to be understood. So by way of conclusion, um, in my larger project, Aron is just one, um, or it's just the beginning of what I argue is a long lasting relationship between biological and historical ideas in 20th century France. What I think is surprising about this story is that evolutionary theory did not, in this case, feed into de deterministic or reductionist ideas about the social or about historical progress. Instead, philosophers drew on biology to animate theories of contingency, resistance, and individual autonomy. Biology, from evolutionary theory and genetics to embryology, became not only a way to think about the material unfolding of history through the human organism, but a resource for thinking about the limits of knowledge and therefore perhaps of universalism itself. In other words, French biology was part of an ongoing conversation about what liberal values could look like in the changing tumultuous landscape of the 20th century. Thank you so much, Isabel. So I'm moderating the Q&A session and Let's just wait two moments if there are any questions from the audience, and then I will go to our presenters. Just a moment more. All right, and then I'm going to go to Charles. So, Charles, you have your hand up, so go ahead. Um, thanks, Isabel. Uh, all very new to me except little bits about Claude Bernard and very interesting. And staying in my comfort zone, question about vitalism. So except for Claude Bernard, who actually seems to do something interesting, including inadvertently in the way he's always sort of fighting with the concept and worrying that he himself might be one and trying to push people like Bichat into a box where they're still too metaphysical and not experimentalists, 
even though he himself in the end, as I think that's what you meant when you said you referred to Kurohi's comments on the um, internal environment in Bernard as a kind of crypto teleology. Well, right. So milieu intérieur has something weakly vitalistic about it. What I meant to say is in the case of Bernard, it does seem like an interesting problem to me, sort of almost at times like a repressed problem for him. By the time of the late 19th, early 20th century, and this is a question, I'm just putting it in the form of a comment. It seems like the word is not a very interesting word. It's just sort of, it means metaphysics or it means spiritualism or it means bad science, but it doesn't seem to have any special content to it. Um, is, that, is that a wrong impression? Does it have any interesting content to it? No. Um, I think, well, in the example that, or in the brief mention that I make of the term, which is, I think, only in that uh, via Colliery, um, no, like I, I, I'm not, I'm kind of intentionally maybe like not invested in like delimiting what counts as vitalism or in labeling um, in labeling any of these people one way or the other, except insofar as it, I think that the, the use of it as a slur clearly already, I don't know if slur is a strong word, but is a derogatory term already exists for the kind of um, philosophical actors that I'm looking at. Um, and so there's a sort of um, self-consciousness, at least on like Aron's part about, you know, Bergson is perhaps like a little too vitalist and like, it's not really, um, he doesn't want to be seen as too aligned with that kind of metaphysical vitalism. Um, and so at least for me, like the interesting thing to track is exactly the kind of, what I would say is like a more epistemological definition of vitalism, which is just an, an investment in the line between life and non-life and specifically in biology as its own discipline as autonomous from um, the physical sciences. So like that is a kind of um, piece of vitalism that I am interested in tracking and less so the question of uh, metaphysics or whether this is like being, the term is being used too broadly. Um, so I don't know if that kind of gets at your question. Okay, okay. I mean. Thank you. So I would add that at least in the work of someone like Ledon Tech, uh, vitalism is used as an almost straw man argument. So, there, so there's, there's a kind of uh, polemical use of vitalism that allows individuals uh, in this space to articulate certain positions where they have this idea of what vitalism is. And then they say, well, I'm against uh, this account of vitalism. I am against that account of vitalism. And look at these vitalists who are unscientific um, and or who make all sorts of, of metaphysical claims or claims about organisms and evolution or development. And I'm interested in making these claims because I myself am a scientist. Um, but Phil has a question and I want to, or a comment, I want to get right to him. Oh, Phil, you're muted. Why don't you take the uh, question on the, uh, from the audience first and then you can come in. Sure, sure. So, that's right. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Eric Holloway um, notes uh, for his question, what did uh, Aron think uh, was responsible for evolution in the past? Or did he just think it was something unlike anything we can know uh, we can know from the present, or is it otherwise unknowable? I just muted myself instead of unmuting myself. Sorry. Um, so, I my set he, my read is that he essentially kind of um, adopts that the kind of agnosticism about exactly which things govern, which natural laws or which um, processes, uh, mechanisms governed evolution in the past, but not, I mean, he's sort of 
because he catches Coleri exactly at this moment of um, what I call sort of a certain kind of epistemic modesty and where he's saying there's like certain things we may never know. I mean, it's not a question of um, whether, but, it, but exactly whether the, the mechanisms can be understood. And that I'm suggesting is becomes a piece of our own sort of perspectival philosophy of history where he's not saying you can't know anything about the past and he certainly isn't claiming to like weigh in within the biologists debates, but he's sort of like um, taking up this biological problem and seeing a parallel with this historical question of how much can you know about the past from this um, very local perspective of the present. Um, so it's not a matter of casting doubt on, on the on natural history but just on um, whether you can create a kind of universal picture of, of how it all transpired. So, Phil, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I had a question here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for a very interesting paper and making, uh, generating some very interesting connections that I hadn't actually thought about. But, but then uh, that's where my question comes from. Uh, you made a comment, and maybe you could flesh this out a bit, that that these uh, people drawing on these Neil Lamarckian views were, in fact, uh, they seem to be pessimistic about the progress in history. And it would seem that uh, it would be working in, as a Lamarckian, you would be working another way. And I mean, I'm thinking something that's coming out of that environment, like Tyre de Chardin, for example, you get these very progressivist uh, kind of views. Whereas, uh, and, and yet you seem to say that they're really pulling away from that. And there really isn't a, uh, a, a progressionist view of the philosophy of history, which would seem just intuitively anti-Lamarckian, but maybe you could count comment on that. Um, no, I think you're pushing me on a kind of maybe some imprecise language uh, or like that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I, th I think what I was trying to get at in more like, um, in more general terms is the the a move away from the like a kind of optimistic like an epistemological optimism that you could really um see the direction that history was going to go in based on these sort of universal laws of history right and and um not so much well not so much a story of decline although again via la dantec potentially of stasis or like a question of like how much um, how much more is there to go? I mean, maybe this is like the end and whether or not that's a pessimistic or optimistic view is, is it really depends mm -hmm. on the interpreter or the, and also the exact political um, persuasion of the, of, the, of the interpreter of that idea. So I think maybe you're pointing, I, I think I could be more precise and I can think about how to be more precise about why, you know, what's the, what's the relationship between like progressive universal and like optimistic versus pessimistic um, and, I, and yep. I, I have to go back and see whether I could improve the wording, but that's what I was getting at. Okay, so, so in other words, I mean, but you, you put a, quite a bit of emphasis on the restriction that have been posed by this one particular scientist that Colliery is reading, Don Tech, uh, that is pretty much saying that we're limited in, in this, and this would give us, at least I'm understanding there where this might be coming from, yes. Yes, so, so we're limited, and the reason that that's sort of a kind of pessimism is because what it means is that we can't, there's no way to recreate um, or to generate evolutionary processes in the present anymore. And so that could go with a kind of more poli general political pessimism, or it could just be like, well, we're never going to be able to fully understand the mechanisms because it's done and nature herself has stopped experimenting. And so that is a more like a disciplinary pessimism, you could say, um, about the, the potential of evolutionary uh, biology. Good. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So there's also, I'll just add before getting to the Q and A, that there's also this really fascinating book called the concept of America, uh, the concept of equilibrium in American social thought by Cynthia Eagle Russa that talks about the ubiquity of equilibrium metaphors in uh, the social, uh, the social scientific thought in the United States. So, and I, I think that's a, uh, across po political persuasion. Um, 
um, might be interesting in terms of looking at the ubiquity of this metaphor of stasis or equilibrium around the time that the Don Tech is writing and your figures as well. So Stuart Newman um, uh, points out that a lot of this sounds like historical materialism without marks, which brings a, uh, a it, so can you respond to that a little bit or, or un, unpack sort of um, how, how that relates, how that assertion relates to your work. So it definitely, I mean, I don't, ex it's to me, I would say one of my um, intuitions, I guess, going into this project years ago was that, oh, maybe people take up biology um, within history as a kind of replacement, because how do you anchor, yeah, how do you material, materially anchor history? I see that, I actually decided that that's not what I think is happening in, in these cases. I mean, it is a response to a kind of uh, Marxist, so it's in some senses, it, it's also in conversation with um, Marxist history at the time, but I think actually that what I would say perhaps, perhaps criticism or um, is maybe more applicable to the uptake of biology and contemporary history right now where people are returning to biology as a kind of like re resource to, to write the history of the Anthropocene and like this new new allegiance. Um, I think, anyway, that's like a really a much longer conversation. I, I, I That was my first intuition years ago. I actually think it is not an attempt to kind of do secret historical materialism. It's actually an attempt. It's actually connected to attempts to um, really elevate contingency and unknowability, um, which I would say is is counter to that to that to historical materialism. Okay, so we are now getting lots of questions. So one, so uh, this question is from Alejandro Fabrejas Tejeda, uh, in which he says, "Thank you very much for the talk. Excellent work." Um, could you say something about Kohlrabi's uh, later reconstructions of the history of biology? Uh, for example, in his, uh, in his book, Les, uh, Les Etapes de la Biologie, um, how was his historiography laid out? Uh, did, he put, uh, did he publish there? Was he pushed there for, uh, uh, did he push there for a particular philosophy of history? And if not, um, did it, uh, and if so, did it coincide with the one advocated by Aron? Oh, um, I would, oh, yeah, no, um, I really don't know that text well. I think that's a great, it's a, it's a great question in that it makes me want to read that, that later text. I don't, I mean, does it coincide with the own? I, I don't want to actually even guess given my lack of knowledge of the text. Um, I wish this was more of a dialogue because then I would ask why that's, why is that the, the, the text in particular you're interested in. So maybe that can be like an email conversation. I'd love to talk more. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Eric Holloway uh, questions, what changed between the French biologists and the modern biologists? Um, uh, the French seemed very skeptical regarding a Mendelian mutation natural selection driving evolution. Uh, but that seems to be what all biologists believe today. So what happened to these French objections? Um, so I would like, seriously, that this is something that other people have written a lot about. And I would be like, I, I think there are people here who could probably speak better to like, what, why is it that, what brought the French into line with the modern synthesis? And I only rely on other people's work when I um, go over this in my own. So I feel, um, I feel like there could even be somebody else in this room who wants to say like, what, what, what is it that meant that we went from the story I just told to like the Nobel prize uh, going to Jacob and Minot and Luff, like, uh, and I'm also uh, pretty hesitant to make causal arguments to begin with. Um, and anyway, it's, um, there are lots of experts on that question. Okay. So we have one mi minute, so that leaves just uh, a little bit of time for David's comment or question. You're muted, David. On the answer to the last question, I, I think that we should 
refer to Dick Burian's work, and I, I wish he could say something about it because he and Jean Guillaume really did try to address exactly that question. My, my question is related, um, and I'm not sure. It, it occurs to me that the phenomena that they were uh, uh, stressing on as opposed to heredity that you listed were plasticity, fitness, and um, how do you get new phenotypes? What a remarkable uh, list of things that uh, it seems to me that the Dobzhansky wing of the modern synthesis uh, actually tried to answer those within a neo-Darwinian framework. I wonder if they were conscious of trying to do that. Conscious of trying to answer the, conscious of doing that within a neo-Darwinian Yes, yes, framework? how to get that inside, yeah. I'm not, I, I, t I take your point about that triad being interesting and I don't exactly know what the answer is. I mean, yeah, it's I'm not trying good, to. It's a good question anyway, I think. <laughs> okay, so any further questions from the audience? Any further questions from our panelists? Because we really have to move on because we are right up on where we have to have uh, John Jackson's talk on, on, on rhetoric and history and philosophy of science. Thank you again, Isabel, it was fantastic. Very good. John Jackson is a professor in, in the James Madison College of Public Affairs at Michigan State University. He specializes in the history, philosophy, and rhetoric of the scientific study of race. His work has appeared in ISIS, Philosophy of Science, Rhetoric Society Quarterly, and other journals. He is the author or editor of six books, the most recent of which is Darwinism, Democracy, and Race, co-written with David DePew. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is John Jackson. I am a professor in the James Madison College of Public Affairs at Michigan State University, and I have had the honor of being one of David DePew's co-authors on our recent book, I guess it's four years old now, uh, Darwinism, Democracy, and Race. And I want to speak on the rhetoric in the history and philosophy of science. David and I share more than just co-authorship. Uh, we met in 2002 at a workshop he put together at the University of Iowa. And we found ourselves in this unique position. I was trained as a historian of science. He was trained as a philosopher of science. And because of the arc of our academic careers, we both found ourselves in departments of communication where we were introduced or reintroduced to the discipline of rhetoric and found out how rhetoric can help us both in our work, in our shared interests in the history and philosophy, particularly of biology. So my goal for today is to go through these four I guess five topics on what we mean, what, what I mean by the history and philosophy of science often talked about just with the initials HPS. And my first point here is that there is an ongoing tension within HPS as a distinct discipline that I will outline for you. Talk about how HPS appeared before Thomas Kuhn's uh, important work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, first published in 1962 and a second edition in 1970, perhaps the most important philosophy of science book written in the post-war period um, and added to our vocabulary, not just in the academy, but beyond the academy with its talk of paradigms and paradigm shifts and things like that. Talk about HPS after Kuhn. And then intervene in that idea through the, through the notion of rhetorical argumentation as a way forward for HPS, that if HPS adopted more strategies as outlined in rhetorical argumentation, uh, it could show new insights into the discipline of HPS that would solve some of those tension I've out tensions I've outlined in the first point. And then finally, I'm going to talk some about David DePew's contribution in bringing rhetorical argumentation into HPS. So that's our agenda for today. 
So this is the first topic. What, when I say there's a tension within HPS, what am I talking about? What is um, the tension that I'm trying to address? Well, this quotation from the uh, first editorial note in a new journal in 1970, the Studies in History and Philosophy of Science, outlines it fairly well. And I'm not going to read this for you uh, word for word. But the idea here is, is that there is a hope or a goal that historically informed and philosophically sensitive scholarship can reveal things about the practices and theories of science that would otherwise be hidden. The problem is, is that each of these disciplines, history and philosophy of science, are also freestanding disciplines. And merging them together, and anyone who's done interdisciplinary work knows this is the case, merging together two disciplinary approaches in a single work is beset with dangers. And the danger in this case is that philosophy of science is looking for generalities, looking for normative uh, features of science uh, in order to pass judgment on science as being you know, philosophically sound or not. Historians of science don't have that emphasis. They're interested in thick descriptions of scientific practices or theories, the actual lives and institutions of science, which may not be philosophical in nature. Um, and I just point out my own training as a historian. Uh, when, when, when I look at this quotation, I get a little, you know, this, what is this minutia of his, this dismissive minutia of historical scholarship part of me says, um, that's the point, right? The point is to get into the details. Details are important. Uh, we shouldn't gloss over them. And then I check myself and realize that's my own disciplinary training. And I'm reminded of my work with David, where I would send him uh, three or four pages of uh, incredibly detailed descriptions of a particular scientific paper or experiment um, that I thought was really important. We need, we need all this detail in there. And he would be able to take it and meld it into a kind of a beautifully crafted paragraph that in fact, distilled everything that was important over my three pages. And um, this is an example of uh, his strengths in philosophy, um, checking my over eager approach to the minutia of historical scholarship. So this is the problem, right? We have two different disciplines trying to write together but often getting pulled in opposite directions because of the demands of the discipline. And I can't help be reminded of Alice through the looking glass when uh, the white queen offers her a job as her, uh, my lady's maid because you get jam every other day. And Alice politely declines and says, I don't even like jam. And the queen says, the rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, never jam today because it's jam every other day and today isn't any other day you know. And this is kind of what HPS is like. Um, you can drop down into this literature almost any year you want and you can find, oh, H, you know, history and philosophy science used to work so much better and now it's falling apart. Um, jam yesterday, we have to do something to make it better. Jam tomorrow, they're never satisfied with the state of the field as it exists. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about what HPS, and this is before HPS almost had a name as a disciplinary standing, but um, against kind of a common interpretation, I hold that in fact, history and philosophy of science were melded together better before Thomas Kuhn than after Thomas Kuhn's famous book. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, the founder, in many senses of the history of science as a freestanding discipline was George Sarton, a Belgian scholar who came to the United States and landed at Harvard fleeing World War I, who set out a vision for the field. And Sarton was in very many ways a 19th century positivist. He, he, he really admired August Comte, who, who put forth positivism, named positivism as the growth of positive knowledge over time. And Sarton was fully committed to this view and particularly the idea that 
science knowledge is a unified whole. Everything is connected to everything else. And so if you sit down to write science, if you look at the second uh, uh, quotation here, um, and he articulates this various ways uh, in the 19 teens, that the only rational way to subdivide this history is not to cut it all up according to countries and scientists, but only according to time. And so Sartin would write these enormous volumes, each covering 50 years of world history. So the history of science, because of this positivist vision of Sartin was doing world history uh, in, in, uh, far before historians in general, at least in the West, were doing world history, which started around the 1970s or so. But this idea that science is progressive, Sargent took for granted, and the goal of the history of science was to show the progressiveness of science and to show the unity of knowledge. Philosophers Meanwhile, starting in the 1920s and 1930s, adopted a different form of positivism, often called logical empiricism. So this philosophical quest, which was also positivist in nature, was to essentially re-describe science using the terms of logic. Logic had undergone a tremendous revolution at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, and these philosophers thought their job was to offer rational reconstruction of scientific knowledge, that we take physics in particular, um, in fact, exclusively physics, and rationally reconstruct it using logical notation to show that it is, in fact, a rational enterprise. And uh, one of these Hans Reichenbach, one of these logical empiricists in this book in 1938, describes rational reconstruction as a fictive construction, a better way of thinking than actual thinking. They did not believe or argue that scientists actually behaved in this way. Scientists did whatever scientists did. It was a philosopher's job to pass normative judgment using the machinery of logic on science itself. And one reason this doesn't work very well, uh, I, I, I've always been struck, this is from a Rudolf Carnap, one of the great logical positivists, um, all of whom fled Nazi Germany in the 30s because they were all internationalists and socialists. But he, he Carnap came to this country and, and, and um, actually replaced Reichenbach at UCLA upon Reichenbach's death. Uh, Carnap spent some years at the Institute for Advanced Study. And there's this kind of wistful passages in his autobiography here on the, on the right, talking about how he just couldn't communicate with the physicists whose work has, he deeply admired because his work in the rational reconstruction of physics was so removed from what physicists were doing that in fact they couldn't even understand one another because Carnap's project was so removed from physics as actually conducted by physicists. And so here is a central problem for this idea of, of philosophers passing normative judgments onto physics that are completely, if not absolutely separated from the actual practice of science, which would seem to be a problem. All of this changes after the foundational work of Thomas Kuhn in 1962. And I'm not going to go through all of Kuhn's uh, idea here of scientific revolutions. Kuhn was a physicist at Harvard, um, told by James Conant, the president of Harvard, to how about if you come up with a class that we can teach scientific methods to non-scientists? And Kuhn has this idea, well, let's go uh, read some history of physics. And what we will find out is that science progresses very nicely through the ages and sits down to read Aristotle's physics and is kind of dumbfounded by what he has found. Um, this is nothing like modern physics. This is completely different from modern physics. And in fact, maybe if we thought philosophically about 
how science has changed over time, we might find things like Aristotelian physics does not translate in any straightforward way into Newtonian physics or Newtonian physics into Einsteinian physics. And this quotation on the right is uh, the famous opening line of Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is the idea that if we look to the history of science, we can ground our philosophical understandings in that history. And the idea is, so you, you, re you remember that the opening quotation I showed you from Buchdahl and, and Loudon was from 1970. There was this flowering of this notion of history and philosophy of science, HPS, as its own discipline in Kuhnian footsteps here. How did it work out? Well, jam tomorrow, jam yesterday. So let's look. Uh, this was one of my professors actually, uh, uh, who, who passed away a few years ago. Um, and I learned a great deal about the history of the philosophy of science from Ronald Gere. Um, and he sounds not a not uncommon reaction to HPS, which is there is no clear cut way that historical case studies could lead to certain philosophical conclusions. And until we unpack those specific ways that historical case studies can, can bring out general philosophical conclusions, um, this is a futile sort of thing to do. Uh, and again, my historical, uh, my historian training wants to rebel at this notion of case studies. Um, historians often would say, we don't write case studies. This isn't a case study. This is a historical account of specific events that appeared in time and space and are not in fact case studies um, of any larger general point that can only be achieved by you philosophers ripping the context from, from our finding and, and trying to apply it uh, a historically to something else, which is what L. Pierce Williams wrote in 1975. Should philosophers be allowed to write history? No. This is a, a rather notorious review he did of a, a biography of Michael Faraday written by Joseph Agassiz. Um, Williams had written his own biography of, of Faraday and found that Agassiz's biography, Agassiz was a Popperian so committed to the philosophy of science as expounded by Karl Popper that he twisted Faraday's research, his physics, his ideas in order to fit it into this uh, Popperian um, paradigm. Uh, the historians would argue that this is a mistake. Then at, at some point, your philosophical conclusions should not be driving your historical research because what you do then is you go in and you try to find examples to prove your philosophy true rather than giving us an accurate account of what someone like Faraday actually did. This is an extreme but maybe not a typical response from historians to philosophies, philosophers writing history of science. Meanwhile, Stephen Brush, a historically informed physicist, and in fact produced um, um, good histories of physics, publishes another rather notorious article, Should the History of Science Be Rated X? One of the things Kuhn talked about is if you look at science textbooks, textbooks written for the teaching of science. You, they often begin with little potted histories of genetics or botany or quantum physics or you know whatever the science is. There's usually a little opening chapter there that presents the history of the discipline. And of course, this is a triumphant sort of history that leads us up until today. And, and Kuhn was a very harsh critic of what the, these textbook histories um, that in fact made hash, L. Pierce Williams uh, words, of the actual kind of his best historical accounts, the historical accounts with the best evidence and things like that. And Brush's point is that scientists shouldn't be reading this stuff. <laughs> 
right? We're trying to train scientists here. And if you start telling budding scientists that um, um, this is due to social factors or this is due to prejudices of scientists, or in fact, the, the, the classic experiment that proved X to be the case, in fact, was much messier and was much less clear cut that proved X was the case. And that is in fact, an idea that came much later than the actual experiment itself. This is not a good way to teach scientists how to do science. And so you get this kind of three-way pull between the need to inculcate scientists, which is these textbook histories supposedly did, versus the actual work of historians of science who were upset at the philosophers who were mad at the, you know, it just, and a lot of this is clearly boundary work. A lot of this is kind of saber rattling at the borders of your discipline to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, you're not in the union, you shouldn't be doing this. And so I don't want to, overstate this, uh, there is a genuine intellectual problem here, but there's also a lot of worrying about one's own disciplinary credibility at the same time. And I will also say that, you know, Brush produced very good his histories of physics. At least that's my memory. It's been a while since I've looked at them. There are scientists who write good histories. There are historians who do good philosophy, but in general, as a rule, this pull between two disciplinary methodological requirements um, is a very real one and continues to be negotiated within HPS. So these quotations, the first two are from, uh, uh, these are my introduction when I was in graduate school um, to the discipline of HPS, which was almost, you know, Steve Fuller declared dead and uh, uh, Michael Roos, uh, uh, a very famed, a very good HPS scholar. Um, not perfect, but good. Um, not perfect like the rest of us. I was hoping to do HPS kind of work and was confronted with this sort of thing um, upon my entry to graduate school. Um, and this last quotation here, uh, I just, shows that this is an ongoing tension in HPS. The methodological standards of either discipline work against each other in a significant way. So that's the tension that I'm trying to address. And that's the attention that I think um, David uh, was well aware of um, when he entered into the Department of Communication at the University of Iowa and, and uh, maybe not introduced, but reintroduced to rhetorical traditions. So here's the need. The need in HPS is we need a theory of argument that makes normative judgments possible because that's what philosophy is all about. Philosophy is all about making a normative judgment about soundness of argument, rationality of argument, that idea. But that judgment cannot be divorced absolutely from actual scientific practices, which was the problem with logical empiricism, right? Your standards of judgment come from outside scientific practices. Science seems to work, so your judgment does not seem to be relevant if it's not logically valid, logical empiricist. Our buildings aren't falling down and our airplanes are flying. So, we need to make normative judgments. Those judgments have to emerge out of pra scientific practice, but you can't just reduce your judgments to a description of scientific successes or failures. So when historians sit down to describe the past in detail, you cannot simply describe what went on and leave it at that. You need to be able to make some sort of judgment about what you have recounted. Where do those standards of judgment come from? How do we get to those standards of judgment? My answer, and I think David's answer, is rhetorical argumentation provides us such a theory. So let me say some things about rhetorical argumentation. Right there, it's big and purple. Rhetoric has a bad name. Oh, that's mere rhetoric. 
It's time to separate rhetoric from reality. That's not the kind of rhetoric we're talking about. Rhetoric is actually an ancient discipline, one of the first disciplines in the Western tradition. Aristotle uh, wrote one of the first treatises on rhetoric. Rhetoric may de be defined as the faculty of observing in any given situation all available means of persuasion. Rhetoric is about persuasion. It's about how I convince you to adopt my point of view versus your point of view. But notice the other thing that Aristotle is, is emphasizing here. In any given situation, what will persuade in one situation might not persuade in another situation. And you need to adjust your rhetoric, your argument, to acknowledge in this situation, this is the way I will argue. In that situation, I will argue a different way. The quotations on the right are from one of, I, I think, one of the better, better, if not the best, argumentation theorists in the post-war world, David Zarefsky at Northwestern University, who points out that, that rhetorical argumentation tended to construct theories as needed to explain or solve problems. It, it comes out of practice rather than standing outside practice and trying to judge it in this way. And this goes back to Aristotle as well. Aristotle talked about um, deliberative rhetoric, as you might find in, in a policymaking body such as Congress, versus forensic rhetoric, which we would find in a courtroom, versus epideictic rhetoric, which would you, you might find in a speech at a funeral or a graduation or some sort of celebratory rhetoric, right? And he's developing theories of rhetoric in response to those different kinds of situations, because those different kinds of situations are what exist on the ground. This second quotation from Zarefsky talks about this notion of fields and argument, field specific and contingent sorts of things. Where does Zarefsky get that idea? From this book, a book that was almost ignored by the philosophical community, but adopted this is a quotation from Tuleman adopted by the communication community. Tuleman writes this book in 1958. The philosophers don't like it, but it's selling like hotcakes in the United States. How can that be? It's because rhetoricians are picking up on it. Here's a work in epistemology that seems to be tied to the rhetorical tradition of recognizing situated addressed discourse versus one size fits all sorts of rationality. One of my other mentors, Bob Scott, opens uh, the door further with a ethical view towards what it means if we say rhetoric produces knowledge. And these, these quotations, men may have recourse to universal ideals in which you are willing to affirm their faith, but every time you speak them, you've entered into the contingencies of speaking here and now, might be right, might be wrong. It's a, primarily an ethical argument, which the second quotation makes clear. So where does David's work fit into this? David's work is, there's a lot of it. So I'm going to focus on um, three pieces. When David arrives at the University of Iowa, the project on the rhetoric of inquiry is still going strong. Um, it starts in 1980, started by people outside rhetoric, by a historian, a political scientist, and an economist who was looking to rhetoric because they were seeking different ways to talk about what it was their disciplines did. And David arrives in a very fertile ground for a developing rhetoric. And I'm just gonna look at three pieces by David uh, that show the expanding scope of, of, of his work. The first is uh, from the Cambridge uh, uh, a Guide to Darwin. And if you read this quotation, what you see here is David talking about the real rhetorical situation that Darwin faced. Darwin, so David here is not looking at, Darwin wrote a book, it got received, and this is kind of his view of the rhetorical uh, uh, um, situation. Rather, he is looking at we, this, this last sentence here, this discursive interaction, Darwin, 
if we look at six editions of The Origin of Species, Darwin is engaging in a process of responding to critics, anticipating response to critics, and the only way to understand the situatedness of the origin of species is in this larger rhetorical context in which the interaction, the process of communication is central rather than the subject oriented, well, Darwin said this, a respondent said that. David is looking at the interaction itself, which is, I think, the heart of, of the ontology of the rhetorical situation. One step larger, the rhetoric of evolutionary theory, in which he takes the ideas he expanded in that first article one step further into the modern synthesis. That's what the MS here is in this, in this quotation. Yes, there is room for solid experimentation, observation, mathematical analysis, but also rhetorical criticism which cut even the most fertile theories down to proper size by showing where and when they explain and where and when they do not. The situation, the situated discourse, this theory works in this situation, this other theory works in that situation. And redescribing kind of the scientific process as one of rhetorical criticism that more accurately reflects both the historical record and gives us standards by which to judge whether or not the rhetorical criticism was justified or not, that comes out of the rhetorical situation rather than being imposed on it from the outside. And the final piece I will look at is the book that, that I wrote with David. Uh, this book was his idea. Uh, he came to me and said, I have this idea for a book. I'd like you to write it with me. And I was thrilled. Um, and it was a, a, a wonderful sort of uh, 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 process for me. I was, I was flattered and thrilled that he did this for me. This sentence in the middle of the, the under these conditions, facts do not speak for themselves. They need someone to speak for them and for the larger visions they are asked to stand for that once you have reached that stage of understanding facts do not speak for themselves, they are spoken for. They are spoken for by someone to someone else in a specific time, in a specific place. And then you are in a position to enact the goal and the wishes of HPS to understand that argumentation is in fact important, but argumentation that is situated and addressed is the proper mode of understanding scientists and science. And I'll leave you with this thought that this David's work is an exemplar of how rhetorical argumentation could be the jam HPS gets today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and I hope we have a good conversation now. Thank you very much, John. And Isabel is going to uh, moderate the question and answer session. Great. Um, OK, so um, yeah, thank you so much. This was fascinating and also really informative for me, um, just personally speaking. Um, and I'm going to give people a minute to either um, use the raise hand function or type a question in the Q&A box. Um, and I guess that while I give people that time, um, maybe I could start with a question and then I'll go to Chris, who's already um, raised his hand. Um, so I guess my question is just about, um, I think, how much uh, credit you're giving Kuhn here and whether sort of you describe this dividing line where it's sort of like there's this like prelapsarian period where, I mean, I know it was like, that was also rhetorical at some degree, but like it, um, in, the, in the soft sense. Um, and then there's this like period where, and then and what you describe afterwards is this kind of like disciplinary, like you talked about like kind of boundary work where like can history and philosophy work together at all? 
um, what, because it, are there just too much, uh, too different of standards um, for what counts as rigor or whatever. Um, and, and I guess my question was, um, A, is Kuhn, does Kuhn get the credit and B, um, are there um, external factors like what, even like within the sciences that change? Do you think, basically, do you think with the transformations in um, science, which I know is like extremely big term, whether that's like uh, Cold War science, whether that's tra transformations in life sciences, is anything about the object change? I mean, I know it does, but does that have an effect on this unity or disunity within HPS? Um, yeah, that's my question. And then I'll go to Chris after you. Yeah, does, does Kuhn get the credit and or blame <laughs> for, right. for what's going on here? Well, and it's an interesting idea because if you look at some place like the University of Indiana, which has an HPS program, it started in 1958, I think. So two years before Kuhn and the leader of that was um, N.R. Hansen. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're absolutely right to say that Kuhn might have been riding the wave rather than causing a great break with the past. In fact, I think that's probably the, the right reading of Kuhn at this stage, um, ironically enough. Nonetheless, I think it's definitely true that Kuhn was enormously influential in terms of refiguring what a field could look like. Um, this, this kind of, well, Kuhn, and I, I guess, along with Hansen, you'd have to go with Quine, right? After, after uh, 1953 and the two dogmas of empiricism and the end of determination of theories by evidence, all of a sudden you're kind of forced into naturalized, if you're a philosopher and an epistemologist, aren't you forced into some sort of naturalized epistemology um, where epistemology no longer stands prior to empirical inquiry and you have to have a pragmatic sort of answer to that. Um, and once you have committed yourself to that as a philosopher, um, history of science might become a, a good place for you to look. Now, unfortunately, at, I think at the same time, in the 70s and 80s, the history of science as a discipline was changing kind of radically. It was moving away from a, a history of ideas and more towards institutional histories and um, that sort of thing. Um, one of my mentors, another one of my mentors in graduate school, Sally Kolstad, uh, there was a big fight in the 70s and the 80s about whether or not the proper term was history of science in America or American science, because the latter term seemed to indicate that American science was distinguishable from science elsewhere because it's in America and we have to locate it here and that has you mentioned the Cold War, right? That sort of idea um, versus a universalistic kind of positivist science that happens to be in America, but it's still science and it would look the same as if it was in Germany, um, which I think causes a lot of tension. Um, as for changes in the sciences themselves, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. That's it, yeah, I mean, it's it's a crazy question, but I, yeah. Um, well, when I work with David, I always make him answer the hard questions. So I'm gonna, no, he's got, I, I only meant like the object also changes a lot in the period you discuss, not just the, yeah, the discipline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, Chris. So, yeah. so I'm going to actually have uh, Betty ask her question because I ask a lot of questions. So, <laughs> so Betty, go ahead. Not a question, it's a comment sort of straddle sure. Isabel's initial query about um, John's reconstruction of Kuhn and what happens afterwards. And my memory is pretty close to identical. And the reason that I had the reaction that I had to the question about paradigm shift, and I responded with Ma Margaret Masterman's famous paper is that because I'm a student of L. Pierce Williams. Oh, I <laughs> And what people, the people always say, oh, she's a provine. And I go, yes, but I'm the only person who ever graduated from Cornell University who worked with both of them because <laughs> nobody could 
could work with both of them and no one could work with, you know, I mean, this is just a Cornell scene, but John's reconstruction is pretty well as I remember it. Now, John, Pierce, Pierce and his generation, I think had very uh, complicated views as historians towards philosophy. Pierce actually believed that the two should go hand in hand, but they were done badly. He hated Agassiz because Agassiz wrote a, bio, a bad biography. I mean, it's, you know, they were competing with each other. And I do think Pierce's biography, it got the, uh, the Freiser. It's still a magnificent contextual biography of Faraday. As an addition, I just have to say that Pierce's favorite human being, you're gonna love this. The person he mourned the most was Norris Russell Hansen because he died on his way to Cornell, on his way to Pierce in that plane mm -hmm. crash. But I remember every time that he would mention these names, he would miss stuff. So I think, I think what you're looking at, I mean, I really like what you're doing because it speaks to me. It resonates with what I was taught and how I experienced it. The other point to come back to the question about Fuller and to, just to Isabel, what happens in the 1980s is it gets even worse because SSK, right? The Sociology of Scientific Knowledge and various streams coming from Mannheim and people who are entering. So what comes the Edinburgh School um, and then you have different kinds of contextualism. And what happens to Pierce and his generation is that they literally go out of their minds and we were banned in graduate school from reading a lot of the sociological literature. We could read some of the philosophy, you know, and we would be reading, um, we, we would read Lakatos, we would read Feyerabend, you know, this quotation, the creeps and incompetence in the history of science. We'd laugh about that, but we were not allowed to read sociology. And when he, he developed this um, program at Cornell in the history and philosophy of science and technology, he insisted on teaching historiography because, and history and philosophy of science because he didn't trust the philosophers to be integrating HPS in the way that they should be integrated. So to, just to come back, John, I think you hit the nail on the head with this, this period and what happens, it's very complicated and interesting. Well, it's, it's, you know, I think your comment that nobody could work with Provine and <laughs> Williams. Williams, I mean, I think that speaks to actually something that, that is very real, it, which is um, the politics of disciplines and the politics of departments, right? Um, if you're a philosopher, you're expected to publish in philosophy journals. If you're a historian, you expect to publish in yeah. history journals. And those expectations are, are real ones and they impact people's lives and they impact what you are going to be writing. And in fact, I didn't start, you know, I, I have a couple of philosophy articles and I didn't start doing those until tenure was no longer a concern and all that stuff. Um, that's, and, and at the department level, of course, it's even more personal and more, and more, and more difficult. Um, so, I think I think that's a very real thing too that that struggles against the unification of two dis different disciplinary perspectives. And 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 as you know, I mean, you know, I, I was in a history department for fourteen years, tenured and promoted. You don't have a book out, you're dead meat. Well, and, uh, anymore now, you don't have a book out. Why should we hire you as assistant professor? One of my clearest <laughs> memories of the early '90s is. <laughs> And I'm, I'm going to take his name somewhat in vain here. Um, um, Ron Numbers from the University of Wisconsin was, was visiting, giving a talk, and he, he in, in the conversations in the bar afterwards saying, yeah, we're hiring a new assistant professor. And our first question is, um, you know, do you have a book contract or a book out? And if you don't, well, forget it. And this is 1992 or something like that. Um, and Roger Stewart, the founder of my my program in the history of science at Minnesota said, well, that's that's good to know. That's good to know. And I all I could do is just think to myself, Roger, the first time you published a book, they promoted you to full. <laughs> and that kind of, I mean, 
that kind of real life effect, particularly on young scholars, um, mitigates to some, you know, there are what, how many HPS programs in the country where you could probably get a job? <clears throat> you know, you need to have a strong disciplinary identity here or there. And that's just, the, that's just, it's a brutal, brutal job market. Um, do, can, we, can we read the question from yeah, the Yeah, I was going to say read the okay. question okay. from the audience. I would, I would hate to end on that note. So, um, so the question from, from I'm personally speaking, James Hoffman says, um, would you agree with Steve Fuller that one of the failings of HPF, HPS was a lack of impact on the politics of science policy and so requiring something like social epistemology? I don't agree with Steve Fuller on very many things. Um, Compared to what, I guess, would be my question. Um, you know, you can say what you want about Thomas Kuhn. One thing you can't say is that he didn't have an impact on the larger culture. That is not something you can say about, well, Steve Fuller or or <laughs> or or, or, or Feyerabend or. You know, I mean, it's it's very hard to make inroads. In I mean, I, I teach at a public a public policy college. Um, and again, the trying to make an impact upon science policy or something like that is a tricky thing. Um, not that it doesn't happen, but it's going to be an institutional sort of thing. The sort of program that we're, that is hosting us today, for example, is a good example of how humanities can make a real impact on, on science policy and how science operates. Um, but that's, that requires a true commitment on the part of institutions um, that I think we need more of. And HPS could definitely, I think, influence that kind of thing. And I think our program hosting us today is an example of, of some good things that can happen from, from that kind of work. Yeah, so I will make a uh, just two quick comments to, to close this discussion because we really are at time uh, and it's been a long day for everyone. So one, one, this, one note I will say is, is the difference between the reception of someone like Kuhn and someone like Michael Polanyi is really an interesting issue. And there's some, been some really good historical work on the relative reception of both of those authors whose arguments are quite close. And there has been a resurgence in the interest in the history of the philosophy of science, but that you know, it, we need to do more of that. And I would also say, because Isabel and I have talked about this, is that in the, in, you know, the 70s and 80s, you get something called intellectual history from uh, the sort of Quinton Sinner, uh, JJA Pocock School, which addresses and approaches ideas in much the same way as rhetorical argumentation, but yep. tip, but really don't work very much on science um, and on, on history of biology in particular. And it really is a disciplinary divide that you get, for example, with my mentor, uh, Dorothy Ross, um, in the history of the social sciences, but you don't get so much in the history of the biological sciences, say history of psychology and psychology and brain science. So there's a very complex picture about a series of engagements, particularly in the 1980s, and particularly in something called the Cambridge history of, of ideas that, uh, and of the Cambridge history of modern science that did not really occur that I think is a very fascinating story. So um, any last comments from our panelists? Any last comments from our remaining audience members? It has been a long day. Um, David, do you want to say something quickly? I, I just okay. wanted to uh, thank John for <laughs> his talk, um, which captures, I think, pretty much what I had in mind. Um, and also to say that working with him, I mean, basically it was a blast. I mean, we really, we had a good time. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, I want to say that the rhetoric approach uh, isn't a kind of um, panacea. Because if you if you do this, you're gonna you have to kind of triangulate, because you're gonna get objections from historians, 
philosophers and rhetoricians. Uh, um, and uh, that's great because then you try to correct it uh, in accord with what they say and your and your judgment. And uh, I, 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 and that's the way I think it that wor it works well. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Chris and uh, uh, for putting this together. Um, uh, for all of you who've been there, it's just renewed old friends. I would love to be sitting down with a glass of wine with all of you. Um, also to thank Chris Wetterstrand, uh, Devona, uh, Gerald, and all the other people on the staff who've made this a real um, uh, beautiful, smooth operation by paying attention to a lot of detail. So that's all I wanted to say. I appreciate this. A lot. Thank you, David. Uh, so I have some brief uh, closing remarks, uh, which is mostly a thank you. So I'll say that today we have been treated to six rich and fascinating talks. And I think these lectures and our discussions have addressed some, some of the key themes and threads of David's work. And as many speakers have underscored, David uh, has contributed so many discussions, so many disciplines, really impossible to think of the do to do any sort of uh, complete justice to the range and depth of his work across many areas in, in the history and philosophy of biology um as intense and as, in, as varied as our discussions have been and as deep as our engagement has been with various topics uh, i just want to emphasize that you know we really are still just address uh, beginning to address many unchallenged frameworks from mechanism and vitalism to Darwinism to the status of biology as a science, which has come up a great deal uh, and its origins. And that um, for the task, uh, for the history and philosophy of biology, the task is to continue this work of complexifying these histories while also keeping in mind uh, contemporary relevances, particularly for scientists who are becoming, I think, increasingly interested in the history and philosophy of science and in the history and philosophy of biology, you see many individuals who do both uh, kinds of work. Uh, and this has been the case for many years and I'm really glad to see these kinds of improvements. Um, and I think the imperative here is to really also think about what figures are we uh, writing about? What figures are we reading? What, what canonical accounts and what speakers are, are we thinking about in our histories? And all of, all of the presentations to one degree or another have challenged people that we consider to be primary historical actors and people that we consider to be quote unquote peripheral, which I always think is a very uh, un, uh, difficult and problematic label. And I think it's, um, we've done much good work today in, in, in really uncovering and uh, giving good examples of, of how to do this, this work. Um, so in conclusion, I would really like to thank all of our invited speakers. Uh, all of you spent a great deal of time and energy uh, working on your talks and pre-recording them. And it has been a new uh, experience for, for many of you doing this during this process uh, that we try to make it as smooth and as engaging as possible for a, for a, uh, a conference of this complexity. I'd in particular like to thank uh, David Depew, who throughout has helped me uh, conceptualize this, this, this uh, uh, meeting and to think about the topics to be covered and, to, uh, and, the, and the figures to be addressed. Um, and in, in closing, um, I'd especially like to thank my, and of course I'm very influenced by David's work, so it's been quite an honor to do this. I'd especially like to thank my branch chief, Sarah Bates, Alvaro Encinas, Gerald Sumani, William May, uh, the communications of the liaison branch, uh, and the NHGRI for providing a unique uh, space for the history of genomics program, which is the, the, the sponsor along with the Institute of, of this meeting. And I think um, we will have some events upcoming and I encourage all of you on the panel and all of you in the audience to, 
to, to keep a lookout for, for future meetings and future events. We would love to see you again. Thank you very much to the audience in particular for 33 or 34 very challenging questions. We couldn't have done this without you. So it's, it's a bit late. And uh, it, so everyone have a, have a nice uh, Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice rest of Thursday. Thank Thank you. You. Thanks, Chris. Bravo, David. Bravo, Chris. Great, great, great conference. Thank you all.